Well, thanks everyone for coming. I'm Cliff Grossner, and I'm the Vice President responsible for Market Intelligence Intelligence for the Open Computing Project Foundation. And some of you may actually be wondering, what is the OCP doing at KubeCon, which is where, where we are pretty much predominantly, have been predominantly hardware, uh, at least in the, to the outside world. That is not actually totally true. Uh, at the OCP, we do look at software, and we just announced a new strategy at the OCP um, around hardware software coding. And so, you know, five years ago, many people said, we don't care about the physical infrastructure of the computer platform. They're all the same. Give me one, give me ten, give me a million. Doesn't matter. But something happened uh, five years ago in the Google Brain project took off, and all of a sudden, we have AI and ML, we have all these district, we have all these diversified workloads for networking, and Silicon vendors responded, like Intel and NVIDIA and many others, and started building very special purpose Silicon. In fact, we have a project that's been running three years now with the OCP that is looking at the idea that we can build Silicon integrated circuits by using small wafers of silicon and stitching them together to make an integrated circuit called chiplets. And what that means is, for software developers, it, it means uh, everything about a computer infrastructure that they're going to write code on. And there is certain levels of code now that need to be hardware aware. And so you can see in the green and lighter green, those uh, layers need to be hardware aware to do their job properly. And then, of course, we look at something like Kubernetes, which would be in the top of the orchestration layer. It's still pretty independent. But we've started to have discussions now about updating the scheduler for Kubernetes. We now have algorithms in it that look at what's the carbon footprint of the underlying infrastructure I'm running on. And including that, in the decision making. And so when we approached CNCF about six months ago about wanting to be here, and the first thing Chris said to me is, okay, what do you want to talk about? And it took us a little while, but we thought that since we have quite a lot of work going on in sustainability in the OCP, that it would be a good match to try to build awareness around the software and the hardware and that awareness interaction. Maybe maybe at some point in the future we start talking about defining some standardized APIs where software could then probe the physical infrastructure that's running in the in the data center and understand is that a six hundred uh, watt GPU card that's in that server and how do I want to optimize that versus something else? And it's not stopping there. So with that I said okay let's assemble a market leading team of people come here today, a mix of hardware and software people, and talk about where do we go from here, what does this mean? And so I'm going to let the, and one couple things about the Open Computer Project Foundation, if you don't know us too well, we were launched 10 years ago by Facebook, and at that time there were five members of the OCP. Now, today, we have over 300 vendors, so not quite the size of a coupon, but these are software vendors, these are hardware developers, these are the hyperscalers, and our mission is to take the innovations that are coming from the hyperscale data centers, because they have to compute at scale, to make the problems you work on, writing software that works at scale, and make those available in an everyday product filter into the general market. Well, that is us in a nutshell. And today we have over 5,000 active engineers uh, on our mailing list and participating in our projects. Now, that's not the same size as the Kubernetes plan, but the hardware is a little bit different than we can compare the numbers we like. Um, and so I'm going to allow the panel members to introduce themselves. And I will tell you that each of these panel members does have interaction regularly with the OCP. So why don't we kick it off and just go this way. So. Hi, so my, my name's Kate, Kate Mulhall. Um, I work for Intel. 
I'm a, I'm a senior cloud engineering manager, and I have a team. We have two focus areas. One is on the networking side, so that's really about efficient packet processing. And the second team, um, and a few of them are here actually in the audience, um, are on the resource management side. And really our focus there is around optimal workload scheduling and really how can we provide the energy savings. Okay, Do you thanks. want to introduce yourself? <laughs> My name is Jaime Comella and um, I work for Client Heat Technologies. This is a German company offering cloud services and liquid cool solutions and uh, waste to use solutions for data centers. So we are actually in both worlds. We have a foot in each of one of them. And uh, this is important to know actually what's, what's behind your code, guys. So if we could maybe rename this uh, panel, we could say what's behind your code. Besides this, I'm active at the OCP uh, in the waste heat reuse uh, work stream. And uh, well, thank you very much for the invitation being here. Hi, I'm uh, Dinesh, Dinesh Madraker, Director of Innovation at Sivo. We're a cloud native hosting provider and we're running OCP kit in production in three data centers around the world. We've got presence in New York, London and Frankfurt. And we've been running this for two years now, providing Kubernetes clusters for tenants to use. Yeah, I'm Marcel Fest. I'm, I'm from BT um, and we use formerly Dioni framework and Sonic in our um, network stack and um, yeah, we use the open hardware um, based um, on the Acton uh, blueprint and yeah, we run that currently in our production environment as the network fabric. So we've got a pretty uh pretty well designed panel. I'm pretty happy about that. I do have one housekeeping thing uh, before we kick, on, kick it off. Is that um, we do have a little contest over there. So if you put your business card in or fill, your, fill the, the piece of paper with name and email, we're doing a little contest for an iPad. So you can get uh, a little present for being here today. Uh, again, I appreciate everyone being here at 4 30 in the afternoon at the end of the day or the second day of the conference. So with that, let's um, kick off the uh, discussion. And first question that the panel told me they'd like to talk about is really asking the question, what is green software? What, what, what could make software green if anyone were to think about it? And so I think Marcel said he would kick that one off, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so um, green software for us would be like um, treating everything in our data centers because we control the full stack from what what does our heat, um, cooling system consumes, what is our power mix, and also how we build our racks, what we do with our network stack, we control the whole thing. So we can also do stuff like um, automatically have software turning off racks which are needed or um, just use um, the servers we really need and all the others can be shut off and something like that. That's where we see green software also in the Kubernetes world taking care of that as an operator, um, shutting down things we don't need and also um, reducing cycles and using purposely built hardware for specific use cases like data processing and so on. And I think Kate, you had something you wanted to add to the statement. Yeah, so um, I guess when, when we think about green software, um, I mean, I, I guess the history has been, and we talked a little bit about it at the keynote, just with this whole idea around, you know, really when you're coding, you're not thinking about the amount of, of computing that you have. It's just this unlimited computing, and the focus really has been around a, a performance, right? So you're just trying to get the most performance out of the software, the speed, the throughput. Um, and that has really been, for a lot of people, that, that kind of mentality. Where I think we need to probably move that, if we're thinking about green software, is to, instead of just thinking, okay, what's the best in terms of maximum, maximum you know, performance, is, is around what, what is the right, what's the right performance, what's the right from sustainability. And I think that, that, it, that is a, it's slightly different, right, when you start thinking that way. So, for example, if I was to, if, if you were running, if you were running a workload that needed a, that had a high performance, say, say for example, high computational power for running a new, 
uh, vaccine, for example, uh, you might be thinking about where you'd locate it, right? Because it's going to need a lot of power. Um, you don't want to just go on the maximum power. You might be just thinking, okay, I'll put it in a data center next to the solar, next to a solar farm or something. So it's really thinking about what is the, when is the right time to run it? Um, you know, what is the um, right time, right duration? Because, you know, some of these workloads just run forever because we haven't really been thinking. We haven't been putting sustainability in, 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 in the forefront of everything we've been doing. So I, I do think, you know, there is a, a paradigm change that, that's required around the screen software in terms of doing the right thing, doing the right performance. Um, and Intel, very interestingly, um, yeah, actually it was just last month. <laughs> they have, um, AI really starts coming into play here. So um, they've, they've, they're actually acquired this company called Granula and um, it's a optimized um, platform um, an intelligent optimized platform so it um, it really um, allows you to get more out of the hardware so it can reduce your CPU utilization with all this kind of by observing the applications and how they're performing so it's kind of really interesting um, so I, I do think that's kind of interesting when you're thinking about you know right the right performance the right sustainability and then there's kind of this AI dimension to it too yeah, I think the, the topic of scheduling is going to be something that we'll, we'll go through this entire panel because it's really important and Kubernetes really helps with scheduling and the idea that we are designing for failure at a software level from the ground up really allows workload to be moved around a cluster or a data center or site knowing at a software level that everything will recover and I think we've been afraid at an operational level which is why we've kept workloads running and running and running because we don't want to get paged overnight that it's gone down, it's gone offline. Whereas Kubernetes will let it come back online. We've got things like chaos engineering, which gives us confidence to shut things down and move workload around. If we can add something to that, yeah. <laughs> um, we actually work in, well, how our company was created, it was to, uh, based on the decentralized cloud. So we, we, we started putting racks in the cellars of private houses. So this is more centralized than that is almost impossible. So we had to move actually the workloads from A to B to C. To C. So actually in the base of our business is uh, to, to schedule these workloads, to, to move them depending on different variables. And one of them is, for example, power cost, because we do waste heat reuse. Another one is uh, the needs for heating, for example. If we have uh, the possibility of moving a workload to Helsinki, then we'll do that, because Helsinki needs uh, heating power a long time of the year. So and so on. So this, is, uh, this is software is called Krake, which means octopus in German, because it has a lot of, uh, of legs and can move so, uh, workloads from, from different, from side to side, yeah, mostly. So inter internal of the site, uh, uh, he, he just said that, but also outside. That topic of waste heat is also really interesting, mm -hmm. right? Of we always put compute in data centers and then we pay power costs to cool it. If we could find other places to, to keep hardware, could we put it and heat water that is then used in a, in a community or something like that? So it's not just where the software is running and where it is in the data center, but understanding where the data center is located and what else we can do with the energy that we're, we're using. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a really good point. Um, we, we, um, there, there's a whole kind of piece around immersion cooling that Intel has been working very closely on uh, last year with this company called Subba. Um, and, and that is a lot of that. It's, it's for the next generation of data centers. It's this uh, precision immersion cooling um, fluid cloud that they're working on. Um, and, it, and it really is about that, really trying to make sure that the, the energy is going to be, you know, the, the water is, is reused. You can generate electricity um, and, um, you know, and, and, you know, give that back to communities or, as you say, that it's... Uh, it's used rather yeah. than been wasted as yeah, a second yeah. round. So it's not just, yeah, just a waste, of, a waste of resources. There's one misconception that maybe I want to ask the panel to address. I can still hear in quarters, you know, if I try to be sustainable, I'm going to have to give up on something. I'm going to lose performance. Somewhere I have to lose. And I'm wondering if we can talk a little bit about 
the direction we were going in. I can tell you that in the Futures Technology Initiative at OCP, we're actually funding some proof of concepts around heat reuse. And um, the summer company, Summer, that you mentioned, is also quite active along with uh, uh, in, in our uh, in our cooling uh, and immersion cooling uh, programs. So if you, we can talk a little bit about do you have to lose the sustainability? Mm, not, not really, actually. You can improve performance sometimes uh, because uh, with liquid cooling you can actually uh, push the the hour to to farther boundaries in the temperature, so, something you cannot reach with actually with uh, with air, classical air cooling, just because of physical uh, constraints of of the air. Water it has three I think it's three thousand five hundred times more heat capacity as 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 air, um, just because of its density and it's a uh, it's a uh, I think the the term is. Uh, um, Heat, uh, well, the heat factor of the of the of the wire itself. So actually, bringing liquid into the equation, it only, I would say, pushes uh, in the performance direction, uh, in my opinion. I know. Uh, what do you believe, guys? Yeah. So, so in our platform, I think we can have a lot, or we have a lot of potential to save energy, um, and also reduce the consumption our whole company has. Um, and I also see um, like stacks for let's say developers, which can then also show, hey, I have that code line here that's com combining or using a lot of CPU cycles, burning them because I'm just polling stuff. And then you have some, yeah, let's say, um, advice how you can fix that and make that more sustainable also directly at the code before compiling and running it in an operation environment, which also another angle of visiting at it. Do you have a question about that? So for us, that would be a good tool to have. So it's yeah. nothing. We don't have a tool like that. It's just, um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, we can only monitor that on our platform that we now consume like 20 kilowatts more than before or something like that. Um, but we will not. We we currently don't have that insights, but which would be great. So you can directly see, oh, that app got updated. Now it consumes like 50 kilowatt more than before. Would be nice to see that in the future. Not going too much into the hardware for a, a, a software conference, yeah, correct. but one of the reasons we went with OCP is that it's not about using power, it's about where that power is used. So even things like having a single shelf that is doing power conversion that's then distributing DC to all of the servers, it's about using the energy that we're consuming efficiently to use it rather than doing that AC-DC conversion in every server in the rack. If we combine it, we get efficient use. And I guess that extends to, to other areas as well, like the network stack and, and more around the data center. That actually leads into the next question that I wanted to talk about, uh, about why open hardware could make a difference. And part of it is because uh, in terms of the work that we do in designing open hardware, it's designed to run at scale. And at scale, you can't afford to lose even a little bit of energy anywhere. You've got to design it so that everything gets consumed properly. And so when you look for open hardware that's designed to run at scale, there's already efficiency built in that doesn't get built into other infrastructure. And you were just talking to a little bit of that. The other issue is, in order to hook into control systems, you know, we're looking at the firmware that's in the devices and, and the lower layers of software that I showed earlier, and they need to be open so they can be modified to work with the types of orchestration tools that you would be using when you your software. And that's going to have to happen by a community. It's not going to have that. It's not going to happen by uh, some vendor deciding to do that because they think that's the right thing and it's socially responsible. And so part of the ask I have of everybody here is to take a little time to explore. Uh, part of our role is for being here today was we want to cross pollinate between people like yourselves and the people that are coming to the OCP on a regular basis to see how we can make a difference. And sorry, I wanted to interject that. Um, so I'm not sure if anyone wants to talk about that anymore. Um, I think, Jamie, you wanted to talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the data center facility and the factors. Maybe go into that. Yeah, okay. Um, thanks, Lee, for that. 
Um, yeah, actually, um, I don't know actually what's your background, guys. If you are developers, mostly, I'm not sure, but most probably. So um, you actually write your code. First layer is the hardware itself, so open hardware and so on. Liquid cool. I mean, not only immersion, but also cold play. There are different technologies that are more or less established in the market. And uh, and the next phase is the facility itself, right? So um, and everything, all of your code, most probably go to the data center. Data centers are, are mostly huge places. Sometimes 10 megawatts of power are concentrated into a single place. 10, me 10 megawatts is equivalent to the power consumption of 20,000 households. 20,000 households. And uh, this takes only 10,000 square meters, more or less. And 20,000 households take a bit more than that. And, um, and if you Take into account all this power is coming inside. It's, it's creating a value, actually. It's actually moving bits at the end of all. But it's creating waste heat. 100% is going into waste heat. So this is a garbage where you have to pay. You have to invest a lot of energy to remove this energy, this garbage. And instead of doing that, if you could actually put that into a district heating network, into some facility, industrial facility that needs heat, it's a huge leverage. And actually, you can monetize that waste. So this waste, actually, I mean, I, again, numbers, I mean, taking Spanish numbers, uh, I'm actually from, from Spain, so I, I know the Spanish numbers, 20,000 households power consumption, but around 10,000 households for heating consumption. So this heat, this waste heat, is equivalent to 10,000 households in Spain. In Helsinki, much more. So that's why in Finland they're actually moving into the right direction, integrating data centers, huge data centers that actually are heat plants, heating plants, into the district heating. So actually, if you guys have some some possibilities of choosing where to put your code, where to put your, your, your stuff. You're actually doing some, um, making some, some, some effect and going into, so putting a little stone in sustainability mountain we are actually trying to build all together. And uh, because most probably you guys recycle and do other stuff, but maybe not always think what's actually your, your code producing yeah, behind, behind the scenes. And I know Ganesh is also our facilities so we probably have some perspectives on that. Well, I was just going to add that as, as developers and you know maybe some in small companies, slightly larger companies, you've probably got a back office somewhere that's running hardware for your development environments or your staging environments. And you think that that's you know, really, really handy to have that kit in a room next to you, but you've got to remember that you're delivering power to that room and cooling to that room. Whereas the efficiencies that you get of moving it to a data center are really massive from an energy efficiency point of view. So not quite software, but it's an impact we can all have by going and, and even turning stuff off over the, over the weekend. It's stuff that we've been, we've been told so many times, but yeah. I know I've got kit that I just leave on in the weekend in, in case I look at using it, but I, could, I should turn it off. Yeah, so actually I might just come in there. Um, so we mentioned there were quite a few um, software initiatives that we're, that we're driving. Um, one is the um, intelligent workload placement, um, the telemetry aware scheduler, we have the GPU aware scheduling, um, we have two engineers um, that are working on it in the room, um, and that really makes sure that you're putting your, your workload, um, you know, it's, it's like that intelligence layer on top of the native Kubernetes scheduler, so instead of maybe running a, a workload with a node that has maybe only a low memory, you're, you're, and, it's, and it's a hungry one, you're, you're running it on the highest one. So it's that kind of smart decision making um, that we're, I mean, we're in the early stages, but, and we've got lots of feedback from some of you guys um, there the other day, which is gonna really help evolve that. Um, the other thing is the CPUs and, and how, that, how that works. Um, the one I wanted to call out, just because we're talking about idle servers, is the power manager, um, and two engineers from, from that are here too. Um, so really, some of that is, is changing the frequencies of the cores, um, and you can get like a 15 to 30% improvement when you, when you scale the, the cores up and down. The other thing we're working on, and we're kind of hoping that we'll be able to release it in the next uh, coming months, is really around P states and C states. So as you say, um, you know, if you have lots of idle servers, I mean, we talked about in the, in the keynote of this you know, most people, majority of customers, are over about 50% right, of companies are using their CPU utilization maybe about you know, 20 to 40%. Um, so that does mean that there's a lot of, a lot of energy there being wasted because you've got these servers that are on. So if you kind of put it into a P state, um, that's really where you scale your, your voltage and your, um, your frequencies. Um, and you can, you can really get a lot of um, power 
um, you can save a lot of power there. You can also, we're working with sea states, um, you can also put them into kind of sleep modes. And it just means that they're not switched on and they're not, they're not as, well, they are on, but they're not, they're not using the same power. And we've, uh, I was chatting to um, Trisha there the other day, and, you know, we, we've, with, it's probably around about 30 to 40 percent we're expecting in terms of um, power improvements there, which is, is going to be huge. So we're, we're really excited about that. Um, and please, you know, and we do have that at the, the Intel booth at the moment, just if anyone's interested and wants to pop over. Actually, we well, have a very interesting ask. Uh, person wants to ask some questions, so yeah. why don't you go ahead? I am going to open up for questions a bit later, but you know what? If you really feel enthusiastic, go for it. Okay. Right. Okay. I didn't know that. Mm. So, um, my question was: Do you have any data um, that correlates what you suggested um, putting uh, your workload in a place like Helsinki, a regularly becoming place cold? I'm assuming um, to the additional costs that the request needs to pay because every server on the way also consumes energy, right? And the small stuff also adds up uh, to a big number at the end. So uh, do you have any, any research, any data to that? Is that, oh, is that too? Jaime. Yeah, that's what I thought, yeah. <laughs> um, I okay, it's because I, I was like, isn't there anything? But actually, you asked me a really good question in the, in, yeah, so there's, there's, that there's, there's another to. question that actually you asked the other day, which I just wanted to answer because I don't know whether I answered it correctly at the booth. Um, you asked about reuse of hardware. What are we doing with reuse of hardware? Oh, it's wanted, interesting as well, yeah. Huh? Yeah, it's actually a really good question. So Sorry. you come up with really good questions. Um, and if you, if you power down your calls, right, with, kind of the power map, you know, in what we're working on right now, you're actually going to increase the longevity of your hardware. So I think, yeah, I think that's really, I think it's a great question you asked me the other day, actually. I'd love to do some more research on that. Yeah. As well, we have several members that are looking at what we call the circular economy, and because many of the hyperscalers will run a server for 18 months, two years, yeah. and uh, they're still perfectly good for near mortals. But kind of hmm. So they will actually take the servers. I don't read really like them, just what they like to say. There's the firmware needs to be moved off to something else and then run a commercial set. And then they put them into the marketplace. And while the numbers are still small in terms of what's happening, there's a, definitely a good broker. I don't have a specific number for you. But it's something that we definitely provide. Yeah. And you asked another question, which I wanted to jump on as well, and partially talk a bit more stuff. Because we talked about moving it to a data center farther away. Yes, you do have to hit a few bumps in the network in terms of switch, and then the energy just by switches. Uh, but I think that if you look at the energy burnt by a switch versus what could be burnt used by a server to run a particular workload, they're, they're pretty small. That, that would have been my answer as well, yeah. 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 yeah it also, de it, it depends. <laughs> Correct. It depends. Correct. And there should be some formula to calculate optimal things uh, for my workload. And you know what? We're in very early days of this whole thing. One of the things that the discussion that's going on in hyperscalers now is after PUE, which many people are familiar with, which measures utilization of energy of the building or the data center facility. Mm -hmm. There are other metrics we started to work on which measure the actual IP efficiency of the load of the rack, which we don't have. So you're asking questions about where we need to be, and there are some pretty smart people working on it. Hopefully at some point we will get some problems. Yeah, so that's also what we are currently doing. So we can monitor the complete consumption of the rack and also of all the network hardware which is involved in our stack. And uh, normally our switches consume inside a data center around 300 to 400 watt um, for like 32 times 100 gig. And um, if you then have WAN connections, they consume a lot more power because the SFPs in there consume a lot of more power because the lasers need more power because of the distance. So I think there it can add up but there you also need to think about you're not the only one using it. So you need you then to condition it. How much bandwidth do I need? So if I eat just 20 kilobit or something like that or 50, 50 megabit, it will not add up as much as having a complete machine 
in this data center in Germany. Marcel. Because it's, it's just running for you there and the network is normally shared. Marcel, do you have any data on how much an SFP uses idle versus ah. in use? Because that's a very... Cause <laughs> that's <you> complicated <laughs> <laughs> because it's on and off. Um, but normally, um, like a multi-mode is like two and a half watt to three and a half watt and single mode is more. It depends then also on what modulation you use. So. <laughs> Yeah, but they add up. So we are also looking at using the right SFPs there so that we don't have so much power consumption on the SFPs. And um, yeah, that's also what we're currently looking in. Yeah. In comparison to compute, it's much less. That's true, but the energy is coming from a different source. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Yes. that's the only thing which yeah. then matters because of the carbon footprint we are talking about. Yeah. And that's also assuming it's the same server that both places in it right now. Yeah, of course. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. 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 Another question for the other question is not in the present, but another question is not in the present. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so from our perspective, we are currently looking and gathering that data. So we haven't it, and we have a dedicated team inside our company just looking for it. And um, they are now adding up and also yeah, checking where we can reduce our power, where we have issues with our power consumption, and also how we can have more power off grid because that's currently most of the power which we are consuming is coming from the grid and um, yeah, that's something our company is currently looking into. I'm not sure it's information that cloud providers are generally sharing, which is why you're probably finding it hard to find that information. Um, but I think as a community, if we start asking those questions and start trying to make choices based on the information that we get back, then it'll be information that gets provided and we'll start pushing some of the bigger cloud providers into the direction of making sure that they're energy efficient and they, that they are more responsible. So almost voting with your feet and voting with your dollars is, is the way to, to go with that. Uh, the data that I'm, that I'm looking for is one that allows me to, ask, to tell developers, like, hey, if you, re if you redeploy your workload in Frankfurt, for example, maybe your latency will be and we need to work around that. But the the the, the, the the what you gain on your own sustainability worth more than this or so. But I need data that supports that and I want to look into the forward like to maybe get those and be able to do so like I see that the display is in every stage, but I uh, it's in a good every stage, it's in a good direction and uh, Okay, maybe we'll switch back to one of our pre planned questions and we'll come back to audience questions in a little bit. Um, I wanted to come back to some of the discussions we're having and see if we can make it a little bit more concrete around hardware, software, and co design. Right? So, if we were to imagine a world a year or two from now, right, based on the fact that we have both hardware and software and all the people on the panel. What can we see happening? Are APIs something that could matter and could become standardized? 
Uh, is that the way to go? Are there better ways to go in terms of bringing the knowledge about what's going on in the infrastructure to the decision making in software? So, I'm throwing that out there. It's a wacky idea. This is a space force. It's a wacky idea. <laughs> The, uh, the, some of the things Kate was saying about the, the P state, C state uh, stuff is, is interesting. It's the first time I've, I've heard about it, but I know in, in CIVO, we're trying to get performance at the moment and utilization. So we've been looking at how we do that scheduling and how we were configuring just the, the CPUs in the BIOS. But what would be really a way forward would be as if we as developers were able to say this section of code needs to be high performance. And if we could send that to a CPU that is in the state or wake up a certain CPU at that point, and if we have the API hooks that allow us to do that, we can then make the most out of the hardware. And then once we're out of a particularly high usage section of code that we're writing, we can mm. then shut the CPUs down and it's making yeah. those APIs available in, into like whatever Go or, or Rust or C or whatever we're using and having that common API that we could share across, you know, Intel and AMD, and then NVIDIA for the, the GPU side as well. Yeah, no, yeah, I'm, I'm in agreement that I, I think, you know, just, um, I, I just, I just caution when we do talk about performance, performance, I, I, and I, I kind of said that right at the start, you know, I do think we really need to think about the right performance and the right, and, and that sustainability. It is, it is a change, it is a change of way, but, but, we need to also make it easy for engineers here as well to be able to do that. And right now, um, you know, we're, we're certainly in Intel trying to drive as much as we can, but you know, these kind of initiatives would really help. Yeah. I think also Kubernetes as a, as a whole has this API concept, yeah. which you can also leverage to build stuff, which then is more sustainable. I saw some talks about other schedulers which were also sustainable or where you can say I need like this many um, CPUs in the next in the next days for my batch processes or something like that what they do at CERN now and um, there are a lot of people just looking to schedulers and I think if we have more data where we can decide on for a scheduler it gets easier also to make a more sustainable workload happen. So I also consume in like PDUs you have in a data center and every, all of that data could be available as a new API in Kubernetes so that you can hook in as a developer and say, oh, this PDU is not as efficient as the other one. And that is then in, in some form of number and you can say, okay, the whole stack I'm running on is now 68% efficient, but I have one in something like Helsinki, which is 89% efficient, so I can better run there if my workload does not depend on the but, country. But I mean, it's really important as well from a sustainability perspective to be thinking of co-location as well, because it's yeah. really expensive in terms of energy if you're moving your workloads across the network. Um, so that is something that needs to be like location counts, right? It counts in terms of energy usage. So that's something we definitely need to be thinking more about. I know. There's, um, you know, there, there are a lot of people thinking about how do we, how do we measure this stuff? You know, what, what do we need to put in place from a software perspective? So, um. There's also the other part, if you have another intake, like if the country is colder, you have another intake, you don't need so much cooling. Um, that's also a factor which factors in in the summer. And with those things, I also don't know how to measure that currently yeah. and also to make it available to a scheduler to decide on that. That's also something which I hopefully we see in the future. It's also something we've got to make, make easy. I mean, yeah. we're, we're at a conference of 7,000 people and yet we've not filled 7,000 people into this room quite, quite rightly because it's a very niche topic at the moment. So there's a lot of education either we need to do to make everyone care and spend the time into developing code that's efficient or making these scheduling decisions or we as a small group need to make it very easy for everyone else just to get it for free if they use Kubernetes. In, in my opinion, also we're talking about two totally separated worlds. Sometimes we, we, we think about the facility as facility infrastructures as a very strange world, uh, world from uh, the whole software and cloud. Uh, infrastructure, right? And, um, and our experience um, in all these years 
to be also in both of the worlds is, uh, is very positive. So we, we actually in our monitoring system, we gather information from the whole facility and also from the servers and everything flows in the same system. So actually we measure at the, at the core the temperature, we measure the temperature outside as well. And so with this also we can actually yeah. manage the, the flow movement, uh, the workflow movement uh, as well. I mean, at the end, this is also something difficult usually because facility managers are at one side and the hardware managers or even the, 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 the programmers are on the other side and they don't speak each other. And this is actually a gap that we need to, to fill. And hopefully initiatives as OCP can, can actually fill that. Yeah, actually, what I'm hoping is uh, after today, some of the people in this room might reach out to us and understand how they might engage with some of uh, my counterparts at the OCP that are looking at sustainability, how to measure it, looking at um, different ways to bring bridge that hardware software divide and you know benefit from have software that can make the right decisions based upon knowledge of the hardware. I mean, bringing to some extent uh, hardware aware software and scheduling to the to Kubernetes world. So yeah. that's one thing that uh, we're hoping yeah. we'll see uh, after today. Um, I had one more speculative question. It may not be an easy one. Uh, I think Jamie said actually you would kick it off with us. Okay. Was a question around, um, what additional tools and technologies could so. you think about if we move down the road? Mm. Yeah, so already talked about, of course, liquid cooling solutions and the waste it reuse. Already talked about that, about the amount, huge amount of energy actually is needed for data centers and wasted. Um, another, another thing I also have talked about, actually, we have talked about everything already. So I'm just going through that. So is this orchestration tool, so moving loads from A to B to C. Actually, we started, also answering your question, we, we proved that at the beginning when we had these distributed racks in the cellars of houses because one neighbor was going in, you know, in holiday and turning off the heating system. So at that time we realized, hey, we have to move this to a different house because otherwise our cloud clients won't get their services. So actually we should be able to monitor those, those facts and uh, be aware of those facts. So this start, um, start a process in our minds to develop this open source software called Krake and, uh, and of course release into the, into the community the idea in the future will be not only Helsinki and Valencia, but maybe Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere, uh, summer, uh, winter, day, night. So all of these climatical changes that actually make our data centers to behave in a different way. Yeah. So they, they should drive this, this transformation. And then if we go farther into the cloud, as I said, I'm not a developer, so guys, uh, please uh, <laughs> aware of that. We use also lifecycle management tools for cloud. And uh, this is a more efficient of, of doing things. Everything goes automized. This also is a way, actually, restricting, uh, looking at the efficiency to be more green in an indirect way. Yeah. So um, it's running into Kubernetes as well. We're in the Kubernetes uh, event. So this, this lifecycle management tool is running on Kubernetes. It's much more efficient using the, the containers for that. Yeah, we, we will. I don't know if I cover that question. Yeah. Um, you want to say something? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm just, I'm just thinking about um, just software. I know we've talked about scheduling. What we haven't talked about is observability and some of the metrics you get, right? So, um, you know, we, I think I mentioned some of the things we're driving. We're also, we also have a group um, working in the metrics. So they're working with Collect D, Telegraph, and some of the areas that they um, just to provide you with that granular level of metrics, so that if you're interested in your power consumption, you can, you can. Um, you know, come to us, work with us, and, and we'll help you kind of get those reports so you can see kind of what your power consumption is. So that, that's something else that we're, we're very interested in helping people with. Um, I know I'm going back to the software, sorry. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, we, we as a telco have no, not so many decisions as you, as we need to provide the service in Germany. So somehow we need to run our stuff in Germany so the only way for us is to reduce our consumption, which is very high currently, and also terminate traffic earlier in our network. And that's the only ways we can reduce our footprint and also get, get more green energy into our stack. So I'm wondering if there are any questions to the audience. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> Uh, 
Yes, absolutely. What a wonderful question. Thank you for asking it. So yes, yeah, so absolutely. Everything I've, I've spoken about today is all open sourced um, from the telemetry aware scheduler to the GPU aware scheduler to the power manager to the, um, the metrics that we have available so you can learn about your power consumption. Um, everything is, is open sourced. Um, and as I said, a lot of this stuff, we are kind of in early days, there's, there's a huge amount we can do there. Um, as I had mentioned yesterday, like the possibilities here are endless, especially when people start looking at it. We also have, um, you know, like a, a guide anyway as well, just to help people install and, and play with some of this stuff too. So um, a lot of the engineers working on that are, are here. So if you're, if you're interested, please, uh, please chat with them. Yeah, yeah. Is there? Not, not that I know about. I know, I know we don't do it. I don't think I've seen it from anyone else, but it's a really good, yeah. really good point. Something yeah. that we should probably we should. be doing. Yeah. There's, there's, so, there's so much we can do. Uh, the, the question was if uh, cloud providers are exposing APIs or metrics on power usage and efficiency of your workload, and whether you, know, you as a developer would be able to, to see that when you're running in a cloud. We have a, an internal tool for uh, quantifying CO2 footprint of some workloads, but it's not actually, I mean, as maybe you can imagine. <laughs> so, is, there a, is there an answer just, from, from, the, yeah. from the audience here? <laughs> Great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but I, I think that we have talked about energy efficiency as, as a scope in which what we are in control of, right? But I don't think it's only about using less energy, but using the right energy. So there is this metric which is called the carbon intensity of the grid, right? This is, this is a number that varies from, you know, from country to country. And I wonder if you have thought about incorporating that metric when doing work, work Yeah, yeah. I, I know with the, the way we've worked with the telemetry wear scheduler, we've worked it by um, memory usage and CPUs, right? So, you know, depending on whether they're, they're up, down, and that kind of stuff. Um, it, yeah, maybe not for your specific use case, though, but... Um, Yeah, that's a great idea. That, that's
No, no, but I mean, these are all things to, you know, this whole thing around carbon awareness software. This is where we need to start. This is exactly this kind of thing that we want people to start thinking about, right? So, so, because you've got, you've got so many really good ideas there. So how do we start thinking about this? How do we change what we've been, you know, just thinking about that performance, thinking about that throughput, to thinking about, okay, so now, you know, where is, where is, how do we make something, a workload run in the most sustainable way possible where, and get, a re, you know, whatever level, threshold level of performance we need. So these are all really good, really good ideas, actually. So, it's also worth worth noting as well. We're we're always at the moment seem to be talking about assuming that all of the the code and the workload that is being run on hardware is the right coding decisions. I mean, taking blockchain at the moment is that the most efficient way we as a community need to be starting to move our computing towards? We know how energy efficient or non-energy efficient even blockchain workload is and, and adding things to blocks and proof of stake work, proof of, um, proof of work, it is. And if we are starting to move as an industry towards making this a standard, is this really the most energy efficient? Is this the most responsible way we should be moving the web? So there's a lot of things that you can do when you go back into your company and you're designing how are we going to take our product to the next technology level Considering this into your decisions is something that you can do today that will affect a long time to come. On the other hand, there is a, actually, a, I think, a Spanish company using blockchain for tracking the, the origin of the power supply of data centers. So there's... <laughs> <laughs> so How do they account for the power they're using to track the power that they're using? <laughs> yeah, it's like... A <laughs> yeah. Another blockchain. <laughs> Offside blockchain. Absolutely, you yeah. published, uh, Intel published in 2011 a great paper called uh, Development Great Software. Uh, however, um, we as cloud developers, we are nowhere near the metal, the bare metal. And we're talking about 100 microseconds uh, worth of state changes, um, which is a time scale that we don't even think about, um, especially when we talk about uh, big data analytics or stuff that runs for hours. Uh, if not days. Uh, so how do we benefit from, from that research? Is there any tooling that actually allows us to, to make use of these pre states? Yes, yes, uh, so, yes, so that's actually what we're, that's our, our phase one of our power manager was released, right? Um, yeah. But it didn't have that P state, C state piece in there that we're, we're planning in the next coming months to release the next version of the power manager with, with that in there so that people will be able to, to use it, right? But, but you're absolutely right. It has been around, but for some reason it has, we haven't really been thinking about it from a sustainable perspective. So that, that, that will, that functionality will come in. So, yeah, so this will be, this is, um, this is like an operator, right, that you'll be able to deploy. All right, okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I think there's a couple of questions, so we'll go there and then. Uh, yeah, so we were talking about uh, raising awareness, and since, like, we are as a CNCF concern, and I was wondering if there would be potential to start a sustainability tag within the CNCF, which would be, I guess, uh, raising awareness across the project, which would be, has been with yes. our decisions. Yes. Uh, and lobbying companies, such as Azure yes. or, or others, uh, providing the right support. Uh, yep. Yeah, so that's an action item for me. And <laughs> yeah, 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 I think so. Yeah, yeah. So when I get back to, um, to Ottawa, where I'm from, I'll be, looking, I'll be talking to the CTO from CNCF, and I'll be reaching out to Probably Partha, who's a board member from Google, that's uh, on our board at OCP, uh, and seeing about what we might be able to do to start to bring things together.
together and Kate and I have already had a chat about taking some pictures. Yeah. And, 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 you know, the fact that even hopefully now people who are working in the open source projects will be putting that in, in as an agenda. Well, what are we doing for sustainability, right? They may not, hopefully, when they go back, because they may not have done this, right, is, okay, we're going to have this as an agenda, right, and we're going we're gonna to start brainstorming. How can we, we get a better design? How can we get better architecture? But absolutely great idea around the tag, yeah. Yeah, I think it could also be something like a validation so that you have some workload which always consumes the same power or something like that and you run it in different cloud providers and then in the end have an audit who is reporting false numbers. I think it's the same with cars. Some report better mileage, other ones <laughs> not. So, yeah, I think there needs to be tooling to prove it. We have the same for mobile network and everything. So. Yeah. There's also the idea of uh, the OCP is an open, open source hardware project. So y you would like to hope that people are, are checking things. And if you've got one company providing a design and claiming some specs, that it's verified by a competitor. And as, a, as an open organization, it should almost, to a certain extent, be self-validating. Because if you know, someone releases something and it's false, everyone else is going to shout about it. I 
probably say it's something that we have to just push to our em em employers and say, look, th this is this is not on. This is not something we want to continue supporting. And yes, there might be this bug, but actually, it's it's almost technical debt, right? In in an organisation, and like you were pushing it for a bug fix, we've got to push to say no. This is no longer efficient. We can save. I mean, if you go to a CFO and say, if I rewrite this, I will save 20% of our energy costs and it'll take me six months to do, they're gonna bite your hand off, right? So you need to present it in a way to a business that are gonna be value what you're saying, or you say. Oh. Yeah, you can also say something like, oh, I need so many CO2 certificates to consumers. It could also be a way to go to the management and say the same thing. Okay.